This is the Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Tuesday, the 1st of February, 2021, uh, two. and um, I would predict an upcoming quiz when we are done with the fall of the Roman Republic, before we go into Christianity. Uh, that quiz might happen as soon as tomorrow, or as distant as Thursday. So... I would be ready for that, were I you. It will be on everything uh, from what we covered last time <coughs> up to the fall of the Republic. Because there's just so many people, so many in, uh, details, so much information. Having said that, I think I'll close the windows a little bit. Uh, we had gotten to the assassination of Gaius Julius Caesar by Brutus and Cassius and the rest. Unlike the game Shadow of the Empire, which I don't know if any of you looked up yesterday, did you? No. What did you find? It, I read the like storylines and it, it, no. Yeah, okay, good. Then you obviously did look at it because it's different. It's it's not the same, thank God. Um, <laughs> I think you have to play it to be sure. Yeah, don't. 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 No. There, there are better things you could do, like watch cars, cars like rust. Uh, so, uh, Caesar is dead. And this throws Rome into chaos. Because Caesar was the culmination of a process that arguably began with the assassination of the Gracchi. Republic, fall of the Republic, civil wars, first triumvirate, civil wars, and Caesar wins. And Caesar seemed to be the guy who could unify Rome under one man rule. He had charisma, he had military ability, he had ambition, and he also had a willingness to get rid of his enemies, not by killing them all, but by making them his friends. That was a big deal to Caesar. But he was going to take the place of the Republic with a monarchy of some kind, a monarchy by any other name. So, the assassins, Brutus and Cassius and the rest, um, they had a point. They understood how dangerous Caesar was, and they were following the law. Now, Caesar had two heirs. Mark Antony, or Marcus Antonius, who was Caesar's right-hand man. Mark Antony was considered to be basically a lowbrow thug, useful on the battlefield and useful as an enforcer. You pay money now. But not the most deep thinker, not the most political of people, not the kind of person who is capable of reaching beyond his current supporters and adding to them. A thug, a bully, hated Cicero ended up ordering Cicero to kill himself, which Cicero did. But, Antony was deeply loyal to Caesar and passionately interested in dealing with what has happened. The other heir of Caesar is his leading blood relation his nephew, Octavian. Octavian is a thin young man tending towards sickliness at the edge of young adulthood, but brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The way Caesar was brilliant on the battlefield, Octavian is brilliant in politics. Caesar was great on the battlefield, and he was good at making his enemies into friends. 
but Caesar was not great at politics. He was good. He was good. His choice to do paperwork in front of the people at the games is an example of one of Caesar's limitations. Caesar actually thought that being at the games was about him. No. Caesar, Octavian always understood that when you go to the games, you have to be a man of the people, and Octavian never allowed himself to do anything other than be, seem to be at least, really interested in what was going on in the arena. That's what the Romans wanted. That's what they liked. And Octavian was going to be willing to do that. But right now, in the immediate aftermath of Caesar's assassination, the people of Rome are... Yeah, Brutus, you saved us. You saved us from that guy. Which shows you how fickle crowds can be. Because the same people that cheered Pompey largely cheered Caesar, and now largely cheer his assassins. What does that tell you? Does it tell you that you can't trust your followers? Does it tell you that people only go for the person they think will do them good? That people are fearful? That people love a winner and want to be on that winner's side? Well, it should tell you all of those things. And none of those things are good for free governance. Because if individual people are not capable of being wise, independent, thoughtful, then they can they be free? Is it possible for them to be free under conditions where they just support whoever's strongman? Me, strongman. Oh, you great. Oh, no, no. <coughs> now, me, strongman. You greater. Now me, strong man, you greatest. If people are that reliable, it really is one of the weaker sides of any form of popular governance, whether it's democracy or republic. <clears throat> so the crowd is behind the assassins. But Brutus and Cassius are going to make an error. They decide that they're going to be magnanimous in what they consider to be victory. And they're going to invite Mark Antony to participate in the funeral if Mark Antony promises to play nice and uh, not speak against Brutus or the assassins. So, I think I'm going to show you. Shakespeare takes this moment and makes it the centerpiece of his tragedy, Julius Caesar. Please shut the fan and close the shades. And as such, he puts into Brutus's mouth an incroyable speech. That's from case for incredible. And it is one of the great speeches in English literature, but it also does capture a lot of what Brutus, Marcus Brutus, uh, no, what, what am I saying? Mark Antony actually says. And, and the other thing is that in the play, as in reality, they both speak. But Brutus insists on speaking first, because he doesn't want the crowd to get away from it. So Brutus is going to talk about the Republic and the law, and, get, and the crowd is on his side. But in speaking first, hmm, how can I put this? He allows Mark Antony to speak last. And a weak-minded person is always captive to his last conversation. This is what they say about weak-willed kings or presidents, that they'll go along with whoever their last advisor was, their most recent advisor's conversation. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. We should do that, even if it's 180 degrees uh, away from what they had been saying because their previous advisor had advised that. 
It's one thing to be open-minded. It's another thing to have no mind of your own. And if there is a downside to rhetoric and to crowds, it is their capacity to be manipulated by emotionalism. And any, any good speaker, whether they are a politician or a lawyer or a teacher, understands that what makes people willing to act and what changes people's minds, it's less about reason, more about appealing to their passions. I'm going to pause it because, God forbid, I violate some YouTube copyright thing. We don't want to do that. We wouldn't want to do that. So there, you have seen two versions of Antony's speech, one by Marlon Brando and one by Charlton Heston. And in both cases, you see what Shakespeare did. Obviously, this is not history. This is Shakespeare. But you see what Shakespeare did to explain the historical event. In that speech, the crowd starts out absolutely hostile to Antony and to Caesar. Brutus has just spoken. Brutus has just made his points that Caesar was a danger to Rome, that he was a traitor, that he was ambitious. So Antony starts out, I, you know, friends, Rome, uh, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears, to which I always picture this stupid comedy routine I saw when I was a kid where people take their ears off and throw them at the stage. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I come uh, not to praise Caesar, but to bury him. And Antony starts out by questioning how could honor, well, they're honorable men. How could they conclude wrongly about Caesar? And if Caesar was ambitious, was a grievous fault. And grievously has he answered it. But then, through a display of emotion, and through a questioning or a recitation of all the things Caesar did for his people, and an appeal to greed in the will, a little greed always helps when you're trying to make a political point. Uh, Antony uh, gets the crowd on his side. And still, rather than letting them immediately loose, he holds the crowd fixated as he talks about those things of Caesar's, those qualities of Caesar's that made him a great man. And how Antony is just a blunt-spoken guy, he's a soldier, he's no orator, ha, ha, ha. And um, in the end, the crowd gets their bribe of 75 gold pieces, which is a lot. And then the, the, the public parks that used to be Caesar's private lands, gardens, and the crowd is his. And the Brutus and Cassius and the others flee. Now, whatever Antony actually said, and however he actually said it, the effects are the same. Antony is invited to speak by the assassins, because they're showing their even-handedness. They expect Antony to be the typical thug. He's not. And by the end of Antony's speech, the people of Rome are on his side, and the assassins, Brutus, Cassius, and the rest, have to flee. So this starts a new set of civil wars. But Antony is not alone. Antony is Caesar's assistant, and he's a mature man at the peak of his powers, and so he is one of Caesar's heirs. But don't forget Octavian. Octavian is a blood relation, and Octavian is not about to, to allow Mark Antony to take his patrimony, to take his legacy, to take his inheritance, whatever that is. So a new triumvirate is formed. Antony, Octavian, and eventually a third guy, a money bags and a milk toast named Lepidus, Marcus Lepidus. Now, Lepidus is called the triumvir because he funds the other two. But Lepidus is not trying to be master of Rome. Lepidus is trying to survive, 
and it's like being Poland between Germany and Russia. It's, you know, you, you do what you can to avoid getting eaten by either Germany or Russia every single moment. So Lepidus is going to do whatever he's told by the other two. But the first order of business is to get the assassins. So, Antony pursues the assassins to Greece. And in Greece, remember, all the Civil War battles are fought in or around Greece. Antony and the Second Triumvirate's forces meet Brutus and Tacassius' forces at the plains of Philippi. And at the plains of Philippi, the assassins of Caesar's armies are crushed by Antony. And Shakespeare, at the end of his play, Julius Caesar, has this interesting exchange. Uh, and whether or not it happened, it, it's so cool it should have happened. Um, Brutus is bemoaning the, the twists of cruel fate and how uh, he and his noble cause of saving the Republic came to such an end. And under what dark star must I have been born to be the last of the Brutuses and to, to, to see the Republic die with my own eyes? And Cassius, who was always more the politician and the manipulator, says to him, hey, Brutus, the fault lies not in our stars, but in ourselves. In other words, hey, Brutus, own up. It wasn't because you were born under the sign of whatever, of calamity. It's because we screwed up and let Antony speak at the funeral. We should not have done that. That was a mistake. And I didn't want to do that. But you, the honorable, noble Brutus, did. And here we are. And they both die. So now, the assassins of Caesar are dead. And the second triumvirate is going to rule the empire. And they're going to do it a little differently than the first. Octavian will be left with the poorer western part of the empire. And so he will rule, rule Spain and Gaul and uh, parts of Italy. And he's close to Rome. Antony, who is the dominant figure early in the Second Triumvirate, gets the richest part of the empire. He gets the east. He gets par parts of the Balkans. Uh, he gets Asia Minor. He gets Syria and Judea. And he gets Egypt. <laughs> Which is what he really wants. Because Antony was there when Cleopatra had an affair with Caesar. And Antony is besotten with Cleopatra. Oh, he has plans. Lepidus gets North Africa and parts of Italy. And again, he's going to do what the other two say. But to seal the deal, Octavian's sister, Octavian, is married to Mark Antony. So it's a marriage alliance. Antony is now part of Caesar's family by marriage. And they're going to stay loyal to one another because... After all, Octavian's sister is an honorable lady, and her husband is Anthony, so he should treat her well. And uh, and Anthony should treat Octavian well because he's the brother of he's his brother-in-law. He's the brother of his wife. So this marriage alliance seals the deal. But the moment Anthony goes east, he goes right to Egypt. It's like if you're ever babysitting a kid or, or, or taking care of a little guy and there are new cookies that have just been made and they're in the cookie jar in the kitchen and the kid's not supposed to have cookies until after dinner and dinner's like two hours ahead of away the kid will find any excuse they possibly can to get you focused over here while they go into the kitchen and nom 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 take some cookies because what they really want are those cookies Antony goes right to Egypt and Cleopatra who understands politics and who actually is closer to Antony in age but not terribly close Cleopatra seduces Antony but can you seduce somebody who is so eager in the first place 
In any case, they start another torrid love affair. However, Antony is not Caesar. Whereas Caesar could keep Cleopatra's ambitions in line, Antony starts giving Cleopatra and her kingdom of Egypt new territory. Herod is placed under her authority. Syria is placed under her authority. Soon it looks like the entire Eastern Roman world isn't going to be ruled from Rome and by Rome's Senate. It's going to be ruled by Queen Cleopatra and her toy boy, Mark Antony, from Egypt, from Alexandria. This takes time. But Octavian waits until the Roman people who hear about all of this through Octavian's clients uh, start demanding what the heck's happening to our empire? Why is our empire being given away to an Egyptian harlot? And then Octavian speaks in Rome and rips his toga and says, that man who's publicly sleeping with this Egyptian harlot is still married to my sister. He's giving away our empire. He's giving away money that should be ours, that should be yours. He's giving it away because he's besotten by this Egyptian seductress. And he's doing all of this to insult us and to insult me by making my sister a fool. By having an affair so publicly that he, Antony, and Cleopatra appear on the coinage together as king and queen. So, the people of Rome demand that Octavian do something. And this is the beginning of the Second Civil War. Antony's forces move north out of Egypt across the Mediterranean to Greece. Octavian's forces move eastward out of Italy to Greece. Now they meet near the mouth of the Gulf of Corinth, near a place called Actium. But strangely enough, even though you've got two Romans with great armies vying for command, the decision is made by Antony to fight this battle at sea, on ships. So Antony loads his forces onto his ships. And Octavian does the same thing. So this is going to be the naval battle that decides the fate of the Roman world. The naval battle of Actium. Now, Octavian is not a general. Octavian is actually seasick. Octavian spends most of the day in his cabin with a queasy stomach. But Octavian has an assistant named Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa is low-born. He's not a patrician. He's of a nobody plebeian family of Romans. But Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa is a sharp, effective combat leader and tactician and strategist. It is Agrippa that's going to command Octavian's forces. Mark Antony and his effective wife, mistress, Cleopatra, are going to command their forces. So on the day of the battle, the two fleets square off, and it's sort of like a land battle. You've got lines of ships, and they're going to ram, and they're going to catapult at, at one another. They're going to shoot arrows. There are corvuses. It's a full-scale, it's, it's one of the biggest naval battles in Roman history. It's not the biggest. But, Antony, once the battle starts, is impatient. And he orders his command ship out of position. Antony wants to break through the Augustan lines and go for, Aug uh, uh, sorry, Octavian's lines, and go for Octavian's command ship. Agrippa 
has made sure that Octavian's command ship is flying, you know, a, a bunch of gaudy flags. So it's obvious to everyone where Octavian is. Because Agrippa is playing like a Toreador. That's a bullfighter. He gets the bull's attention by waving the red cape. All the bull focuses on is the red cape. Gonna get that cape. Antony acts like a bull, not like a general. Antony acts like a warrior, not like a general. Antony pulls out of his own fleet and goes ramming through a weak point right in front of, a, of Octavian's flagship. And Antony starts pursuing Octavian's flagship, which deprives his fleet of their admiral. His fleet no longer has a commander because he is personally trying to beat Octavian. More to the point, this is all part of Agrippa's plan. Once Antony is isolated, the rest of his fleet gets attacked in an organized fashion. Agrippa's fleet is more than the sum of its parts because it's under the active command of an effective admiral, Agrippa. Antony's fleet have been reduced to a bunch of isolated ships that happen to be close to one another. There's no fleet battle plan. They're all trying to fight individual ship battles. That is not the way you win a fleet action. So Antony's fleet starts getting mauled. Meanwhile, Antony gets cut off from Octavian's command ship and realizes that he's completely far away. He sends a signal which Cleopatra and her Egyptian Greek warships sees, and she's basically the reserve. Antony calls in the reserves to save his fleet. Cleopatra decides, we're leaving. I'm not fighting and dying here. Stupid Antony. And so Cleopatra turns her ships away and starts retreating as the rest of Antony's fleet gets destroyed. Antony sees this, orders his command ship to row away from Octavian's fleet as quickly as possible, breaks out of the trap, goes through his own fleet as fast as he possibly can, past ships that are fighting and dying for him, just to get caught up to his mistress, who's betrayed him. And he ends up having to take a small rowboat because his command ship finally sinks, and he is picked up by Cleopatra, a pathetic, lonely man, and brought back to Egypt. Octavian and Agrippa win the Battle of Actium, 31 BC. It is the decisive battle of the Roman civil wars. Antony holds up in Egypt but it's clear that Cleopatra is the one in charge. Antony still has an army in Egypt. Octavian's army is marching around through Palestine, across Sinai, into Egypt. Antony is waiting for the big battle. He and his men go to bed. When Antony wakes up the next morning, expect to command his men in a battle against Octavian's land forces, led by Agrippa, he realizes that he's the only one in camp. His entire army defected. His entire army went over to Octavian. Antony alone, humiliated, goes back and says to his mistress, Cleopatra, it's over. And she says, yes, it's over. And one of them, probably Cleopatra, says, we ought to kill ourselves. Yes, we'll commit suicide. That'll show the world, and we'll do it together as lovers. And Anthony says, okay, honey, that sounds like a good idea. Uh -huh. And so um, he takes poison, and she watches him. And she ushers him out of this world as he falls on his sword. But she doesn't join him, because what she drank wasn't poison. Antony's dead, because she tricked him into killing himself in a suicide pact. But it becomes clear to her that she's not going to be able to seduce Octavian. 
when Octavian takes Alexandria, Cleopatra, having tried to manipulate Octavian, goes to an Egyptian temple, clasps a poisonous asp, which is a little green snake, to her bosom. The asp goes bitey, bitey, sting, sting, injecting her with deadly poison, and she dies. Octavian is deprived of his victory, which included Cleopatra being dragged through the streets of Rome, Rome a bound prisoner. But it's not that bad. Antony died a fool, and Cleopatra died alone. Now, Octavian is the sole ruler of the Roman world. Octavian changes his name to the man of destiny, the de man of gods, uh, the man destined by the gods for glory, which is Augustus, Augustus. And he stops being one of the triumvirate and becomes the first emperor of Rome. Now, this is where we're going to leave the story of Rome. Tomorrow, there will be a quiz on the fall of the Roman Empire from the end of the Punic Wars to the accession of Augustus as emperor. We will then go into Christianity, tell that story, and then we will come back to Rome's governor governance as an empire. Is it the fall of the Republic or the fall of the Empire? I apologize. It's the fall of the Republic. Okay. Yes, I must have misspoken. I didn't even realize it. So we're going to do the fall of the Roman Republic for tomorrow's quiz. Yep. Um, in the book, I think that they call Mark Antony Diocletian because I think that it was Diocletian and some other guy who split up the empire. Yeah, the no, no, no. Uh, that you're you're combining two things. Mm. Diocletian actually does split the empire, but that's five hundred years later mm. or four hundred. Ah, actually, it's uh, three hundred years later, three hundred and eighty years later. But it's a different split. But it, isn't it Augustus and Diocletian? No. Maybe there not. is... Diocletian has a partner named Maximian. Diocletian and his and Maximian become Augusti, mm. which is the title for senior emperor. Um, it's confusing how Constantine, Chlorus. Yeah, well, that's because the name Caesar and Augustus become titles. Yeah. Um, it would be as if all presidents were called Washington. Right. Uh, it would just... Are, are you the Washington now? Uh, it, it, it is different. No, I get why why you would make the, that connection, but it has no. There's no connection. Excellent point. Yes. Is uh is Caesar stopped by now? Oh yeah. Uh, no, Caesarian. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, somehow he dies uh, or disappears. Um, he's oh completely out of the picture. No, in fact, Mark Antony would. Cleopatra wanted Caesarian to rule the Roman world. Yeah. Mark Antony wanted Caesarian to... He didn't like it. Yeah. Because Mark Antony wanted to rule the Roman world. And then if you had someone else. Yeah, yeah, it, it just undermines. So, anyway, uh, do you have a seat? And uh, you can talk quietly until dismissal, which is in a few minutes. Thank you for your attention. Quiz tomorrow. No.